you, Carla, for the introduction, and thank you for hosting the event. Um, so my name is Stephen DiGregorio. I'm an attorney specializing in estate planning, estate administration, and elder law. Um, the name of my firm is Protecting Your Assets, LLC. I'm located on Route 1 South in Linfield. Um, and this is, this is the only type of law that I do. So I've been specializing in, in this for quite a while now. Um, so uh, I'm a little bit under the weather today, so bear with me. Um, uh, you know, I'll do the best I can to speak up and project my voice, which I naturally do anyway. I'm Italian, but um, you know, just like I said, I'm feeling a little under the weather today. Um, the format that we're going to follow is uh, I've divided this into three different sections. Um, the first one on the ins and outs of probate, the second section on estate planning documents, the, the general estate planning documents that are involved in putting together a plan, and then finally there's um, Medicaid planning or nursing home planning and, or otherwise known as elder law. It goes by different names. Um, so three sections, and we'll spend approximately 15 to maybe 20 minutes on each section depending on how long wind did I get and if I end up going down a a path uh, with an anecdote or, or two and um, and then the way we'll handle questions rather than taking questions as I go in order to keep up the flow um, at the end of each of the three segments we'll open it up to say five minutes of general questions and I'll give you general answers um, due to uh, ethical concerns confidentiality I can't get into specific scenarios you know that would be something for an offline conversation if you wanted to schedule a time to speak with me privately we could certainly do that um, but if you have any general questions about what we've talked about in the preceding 15 minutes that would be the ideal time to bring it up while it's fresh in your mind and um, and what's different about this usually I, I lecture from a projector screen with a big screen behind me and I can kind of stand off to the side and look up at that so uh, excuse me if I I looked down at this. this is my first time lecturing from a hard copy I decided to go low-tech today so um, so you know so forgive me if I'm looking down uh, more than I normally would um, but um, uh, what oh and the nice thing about this though is that you can jot your own notes off to the side of each slide and write down questions so that you know you have to don't have to worry about forgetting it between now and the end of the segment so um, so we'll try to address things then rather than uh, doing all the questions at the end and uh, hopefully we'll give you a lot of good useful practical information um, that you know some of it you might even be able to act on immediately some stuff that you can do yourself or um, you know you may have to deal with some of these issues with a family member and at least you'll have a little road map of of what to expect all right so without any further delay we'll get started um, so I call this presentation strategies to maximize and protect your estate um, you know there are di different things that can eat away at at the size of your estate whether it be taxes whether it be court filing fees registry of deeds recording fees um, lawyer fees nursing home expenses different things that can chip away at, at what you're ultimately able to leave behind for your loved ones as an inheritance so you know we'll be approaching it from from that standpoint so <clears throat> slide number two issues that your family faces upon your death such as who will be in charge of your estate. Now, we used to call this the, um, the executor, and in 2012, there was a major overhaul in Massachusetts probate law. We passed what's called the uh, Massachusetts Uniform Probate Code, MUPC. So it was a sweeping overhaul of um, uh, probate laws that were decades old, and this went into effect in March of 2012. So prior to that, the person in charge of your estate was called the executor, and a lot of us are familiar, at, at least generally, with what an executor is, what they do, um, but that term is no longer used. It's now called the personal representative. Um, and the reason for that is we used to actually have four different legal terms, depending on whether the deceased had or did not have a will, and whether the person in charge was male or female. It was an executrix, executor, administratrix, administrator. They decided to do away with all four of those and just say personal representative, regardless of the situation. So, um, you know, another, another issue that um, uh, families have to face is, you know, who gets what? And um, what will your family actually have to do in order to get their inheritance? 
you know, do they have to write letters, make phone calls? Who do they have to see? Uh, what are the time frames in which all this has to be done? Um, how do they deal with third parties like um, investment brokers and banks? And, uh, you know, will your family have to probate your estate? It, it depends. And, you know, we'll get into that a little bit more. And then finally, how long will the process take? Uh, it depends. Um, I've had estates that go on for years and years. I'm working on one right now that um, it's been at least three years and the estate is still open and, and things continually pop up. And here's where I guess I'm going to go down one of those little, little paths. So uh, I'm working on an estate right now. I was appointed by the court uh, to actually be the personal re representative of the estate. And in addition to probating the, the uh, assets of this woman, now she, she didn't have any kids, but she did have a will, thankfully, which was good. However, she had, a, she had appointed a, both a primary and an alternate um, personal representative, which is good practice. Unfortunately, one of the people that she appointed now has Alzheimer's and at the time of her death had Alzheimer's and was in a skilled nursing facility and unable to act in that capacity. The other person who lived up in Maine was unreachable, non-responsive. No one could get, get her to, to step up and actually do it. So essentially, even though there was a will, in this particular case, um, they had to, the court had to start from scratch and, and try to find somebody who would step up and be the personal representative. And, um, <clears throat> She had several bank accounts in different banks, and I had to do some detective work and ended up stumbling upon um, quite a bit more money, a couple of hundred thousand dollars more than anyone even realized was in the estate. And, and then every time we thought we had an issue resolved, something else would come up. And uh, a quick little side note about safe deposit boxes, just be, de be wary of them. You know, I mean, they are good in certain circumstances, but they can also cause more problems than they solve. If you don't have the right people listed as uh, having access on, on the, you know, with the bank, and if they don't have a key, they need those two things to get into the safe deposit box. They need a key, or need to know the location of a key, which oftentimes doesn't happen. And when that happens, you have to get a locksmith in there, which can be a whole other thing. It took me about, I'd say at least six months to get into this safe deposit box and um, going back and forth with the scheduling trying to get a bank officer and a locksmith to meet me at the same time at the bank to drill out uh, to drill out this box it took six months to get there and it took the locksmith all of 10 seconds to pop the lock and and I was expecting I was half expecting the the safe deposit box to be empty I was half, to, half expecting it to contain legal documents, um, but nothing of monetary value. It turned out that there was $130,000 worth of U.S. savings bonds, Series E savings bonds that she had bought back in the 1980s, and she paid around $30,000 for them. And uh, because, you know what, I should be timing myself. I didn't even think of that. Let me do that now. I'm on phone. Okay. And timer. So let's do. Okay. And start. Okay, good. All right, there we go. So, um, anyway. Interest rates were very high at the time, and though after the bonds matured, they continued to accrue interest, and this $30,000 investment was now worth o over $130,000. And um, that became a whole thing. And we had to reopen everything. I thought the estate was done. I thought we had everything zeroed out, and we stumbled upon these probate assets. Um, and here's the irony, too, is that the safe deposit box itself was a joint asset. There were there were three names on the safe deposit box. There was the deceased and, um, and the cousin and a, and a family friend. And so when, when Dorothy, the decedent, died, the other two were, were joint owners. Well, unfortunately, um, one of them 
was under a legal guardianship. She was she had Alzheimer's. One of the the people named as the executor um, was the jo a joint owner on the safe deposit box. Her guardian didn't want to get involved in any of this. The other joint owner, the third person, lives in Florida, so she wanted to retain me as her you know, basically execute a power of attorney, giving me the authority to go to the bank and access the box on her behalf. All of that took some doing. And this, again, this wasn't even a probate asset. This was a separate case because the, because it was a jointly owned asset, this box. So we finally got into it and then found out that they were, that the box, although itself was a non-probate asset, contained a probate asset, which was these savings bonds which did not have a death beneficiary or a joint owner. They were owned by the decedent, so now they were owned by her estate. So now we have to file a tax return for the estate for this income that uh, we didn't know was going to be there. So, um, so very interesting case. And, you know, so a lot of this stuff turns on, um, it's not a simple question of whether or not you have a will. So and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but a, a common question that comes up is, or, or a statement that I hear is, oh, I heard that uh, if I have a will, my estate won't have to go through probate. That's actually not the case. That's not, it, it's not determined by whether or not you have a will. It's determined by what you own and the character of those assets, what type of asset and how it's titled. So is it titled in, in are you the sole owner at the time of your death or is there a joint owner on it, like a spouse or a child? Um, or if it is just in your name, maybe there's an, a death beneficiary named on it. So if it's an IRA or a 401k or a 403b plan, something like that, it's going to have a death beneficiary named. If it's a bank account, chances are it will be a probate asset. However, there are some banks and certain types of accounts that give you the option of doing something called a TOD or a POD. That means transfer on death or payable on death. If they have that option there, that might be something to look into, which would avoid probate, at least as to that particular account. So again, it's not really dictated by whether or not you have a will because, and again, I'm jumping ahead because a lot of the stuff is, is intertwined. Um, but um, what a will does is it does not allow your estate to avoid probate. What it does is to the extent that you do have probate assets, where your family has to go through the probate process to get those assets to their next rightful owner, you know, whoever that might be, whether it's a charity that you've named as a, you know, a beneficiary of your will, or uh, it could be your children, it could be your surviving spouse, it could be a brother or a sister, whoever it is, there is a process to get your assets upon your death to their next rightful owner. And that's why probate gets so complicated and so technical because the law wants to make sure that they get that right. They don't want to jump the gun. They don't want to just take somebody's word for it. They want to make sure there are checks and balances in place so no one can just simply walk in and make a fraudulent claim to those assets. So what people will say is, and I've seen this happen, children will, uh, after a parent dies, they have a copy of the will, or maybe they have the original of the will, and they'll take that, they'll carry that into the bank, maybe with the parent's death certificate. And they'll say, you know, my mother passed away. Here's her will. As you can see, I'm named as beneficiary on the account and, and or I'm named as the, uh, or I'm, I'm the beneficiary into the will and or I am named the personal representative under her will. Um, so I need to close up my mom's account. Well, that's, that's not how it works. It's not that simple. Anybody could, could forge a document and claim it to be that, that person's last will and testament. Um, anyone can claim to be that, that person's daughter or whatever it is. Um, so there are certain steps that, that have to be followed in order to make sure that that account goes to its rightful owner. And, and uh, you know, we'll get to that in a moment, what some of those steps of probate are. But basically, you know, the, the child would have to file that will with the probate court and make sure that all interested parties are notified. In fact, in fact why don't we take our, uh, turn our attention to the, um, the next slide here, slide number three, some steps of probate. The first thing that has to be done is to notify Mass Health via certified mail that the person has died. So what you do is you take a copy of their death certificate and 
a copy of the probate petition and you mail that certified mail, you keep the receipt, you send it to Mass Health. they look through their records to see if any benefits were paid on that person's behalf while they were alive. If they were, and there's a probate estate in which, in, in this instance, they, and we're not even having a conversation about this unless there is a probate estate. So we're talking about, yes, there is a bank account. It was in mom's name. We have to probate the estate in order to get that get that account into the hands of its rightful next owners. Um, we have to probate it. So Mass Health will have a lien against the estate in the amount of any money that they paid out on behalf of the decedent while they were alive. So an example of that would be a skilled nursing facility. If they were in a nursing home and they were on Mass Health, all right. Um, so, um, quick story, <laughs> and. So, and this one will be a quick one. I had a gentleman come to me one time. There's, we've all seen the TV commercials for the, the Mass uh, uh, the Treasurer's Office Unclaimed Property Division. Um, call this number, go to this website, see if you or a loved one have an, um, uh, an abandoned bank account or something that's been turned over to the state. Well, a um, man came to me, his mother had died sometime earlier, a few years earlier and he had already, he didn't have to probate her estate because uh, she had a trust and he thought everything was fine. Um, however, um, she was in a nursing home. She had run up about $300,000 in bills. He didn't realize that there was this lien against the estate hanging out there for actually 315,000. And it turned out mom had a small life insurance policy, 1,500 bucks. It had never been, no one had ever claimed it. It was sitting there in unclaimed property. However, um, there was no named beneficiary on the life insurance policy. Big oversight. Small oversight, big problem. No one could just come in and claim, oh, I'm his son, I'm the beneficiary. No, it belongs to her estate by default because there was no named beneficiary on the life insurance. So he had to probate her estate in order to have the, uh, the life insurance company pay the money into the estate and I believe he was the only child, so that he could pay it to himself. Well, this he would have been better off leaving this $1,500 policy to rot because what he ended up paying, for, the first thing he had to do was notify Mass Health. Unbeknownst to him, there's a $315,000 lien. So he sends them notice, and next thing you know, oh, okay, Mr. Jones, well, here you go. Here's a, a, night, a love letter that your mother's estate owes us $315,000. He's panicking, thinking that because he's now the personal representative of the estate that he's personally liable for this. He's not. However, the entire $1,500 payout from this life insurance is, is indirectly payable to Mass Health. So he went through all these gyrations, all the filing fees, everything, all the paperwork to, and it was somewhere out in Western Mass. So uh, going out there and dealing with them, um, just to, just to have to turn this insurance money over to Mass Health, so it was a probate asset that he didn't even realize was a probate asset, and it, he would have been better off not probate, probating the estate. So sometimes you see interesting like things like that happen. Um, he wished he had never seen that TV commercial. Um, so notify Mass Health, uh, file the will, the death certificate, the petition for probate, the filing fee. It's around four hundred dollars for the filing fee. Um, you have to send and you have to publish notice in the newspaper. Uh, it's usually about $500 to publish notice in the paper just to run that one little column for one day, but they know they have to do it. So they get you over a barrel, uh, the newspapers. Um, <clears throat> and you also have to notify any interested parties or get their written assents. Say here, you know, we're filing a will or maybe if there wasn't a will, one of the kids is asking the court to be appointed personal representative the other kids have to be notified, so if they have any objections to their brother or sister being appointed, they can make their objections known to the court before a certain date, so that uh, the proceedings can't go forward until that's all hashed out. Um, tax filings, the decedent's final income tax return. There might be a state tax an estate tax return that has to be filed within nine months after the date of death. <laughs> If the person had more than a million dollars to their name, including real estate, life insurance, bank accounts, and investments, if it comes to more than a million, they're gonna have to file at least a Massachusetts estate tax return. Now, there might be deductions that they could take so there wouldn't be any tax owed, but they at least have to file, and that's supposed to be done within nine months after death. Um, <clears throat> 
file, uh, preparing an inventory of what was in what was in the estate, finding you know finding and gathering up all the uh, assets, um, paying against uh, creditors' claims, any any final expenses, medical bills, uh, the funeral home, credit card bills, car loans, all those things have to be paid off by the personal representative. Sometimes that person can negotiate a lower payoff amount with the creditor. Most, most often in the case of unsecured creditors like credit card companies, usually once the credit card company finds out, and I don't know how they do this, but they do find out that the person has died, whether it's, they have their own ways of finding out, even if the, if the family doesn't proactively do it, and they'll, they'll notify you. They usually, they'll usually sell the debt to a collection agency at that point. They write it off as uncollectible. Debt agency buys it for pennies on the dollar, and then they try to collect from the estate. Any money they can get from the estate is almost pure profit for them because they're paying pennies on the dollar. So what you can often do is negotiate a smaller payout amount with them. So if you lose a loved one and they had an account, a, a credit card account just in their name, you can often talk to that creditor and say, hey, what will you take? Will you take, uh, if it's $3,000 owed, ask them if they'll accept 1500 as full payment to close out the account to today. If you do a check over the phone, will they... And they, they will send you a letter clearing the estate of any liability saying, yes, we accepted 1500 as full payment and satisfaction. So that's a, a little trick that you can do to help pour, put more money in the pockets of, of, of the family. Um, okay, let's see. Distribute the proceeds uh, to the, the heirs of the estate. Uh, file accountings, closing statements. So there's, there's quite a few steps to probate. It's not something that you generally should attempt yourself. Uh, it will end up consuming your life. You'll end up losing a lot of time from work and a lot of sleep. And uh, the probate courts are notoriously fickle, even among attorneys who are very familiar with the rules and the procedures in the probate court. They tend to make up their own as they go along. And it would be even worse if you don't understand the context of how all that works. So uh, it's a good idea to have an attorney help walk you through it. And they end up doing most of the grunt work. What ends up happening is the attorney will prepare whatever paperwork needs to be done at each step of the process and then have the family sign here, sign here. Okay, I'll talk to you again in a couple of weeks. I'll let you know how things go in court later. Um, so we're on slide number four. Uh, will some or all of your assets have to go through probate before, before your family gets them? And again, depends on what type of asset it is. Yep. You have to be through section one by now. Okay. You're never going to get through. Okay. Okay. Right. And a lot of this is intertwined anyway, so I'm already hitting on. I'm not parliamentarian yeah. in college, so I'm just looking at the clock, seeing the section. So, because yeah. he has so much information to pass on. It is, it is a lot. And yeah. it, like I said, it, it's really hard to segregate these issues because there's a, there's a lot. So I'm jumping ahead, but you kind of have to. To explain B, you have to talk about A. So, um, you know, B won't be as, as long as this. Um, but. Um, so, yeah, so when somebody dies, the family will come into my office, and often the first thing they want to talk about is mom or dad's will. And I have to say, well, let's put that aside for now. We, we will take a look at that in a moment, or I'll take a very cursory glance at it. Um, but more so, I want us to sit down and go through what did your mom or dad have, and let's take a look at each particular asset and how it was titled. Who was the owner at the time of death? Is there a TOD, a POD? Um, and, um, and then we take it from there. And we kind of, we, we um, segregate each asset. We say, okay, and I do, as I'm filling out my notes, I make notes, probate, non-probate, probate, non-probate. And then what you do is, whoop, there's my alarm. Uh, I don't even know how to shut this off, cancel. Okay. All right. So, um, so really that's that's and it's it's not the most intuitive thing because mostly people want to look at the will right away not understanding how the process actually works that you may not even have to file the will it's great to have a will but it's possible that it may not even need to see the light of day you know um i see cases where the where a mom or dad had a will which is great but maybe they also had a trust and the trust was the main component of the estate plan and their house is already in the trust. Their bank accounts are already in the name of the trust. So at that point, 
um, it's a pretty straightforward estate administration. There's no need to go to probate court. There's no need to file the will anywhere. It doesn't even come into play. So, um, you know, so it's my, part of my job is making sure we don't put the, the cart before the horse. Um, slide number eight, examples of non-probate assets. Joint ownership of a home. Um, if you, you own a home, you can take a look at your deed. And if you own it with your spouse, um, there's a very good chance that it will have the phrase tenants by, tenants by the entirety. It's a form of joint ownership of a, of a property that's available only to marry couples. And basically it means that when one spouse dies, the other spouse is automatically the owner. So the only thing that would need to be done at that point is uh, in, order to, in order for that legal transfer to take place would be to record the death certificate of the first spouse at the registry of deeds. And even that doesn't have to be done right away. So, you know, some of you may, may have already been widowed and you're, that may not have been done, but that's okay because it doesn't become, you don't have to necessarily deal with it until you go to sell the house or when the second spouse dies. So let's say dad died 10 years ago and then mom died earlier this year. And so at the time that dad died, it was in both of their names jointly. When dad died 10 years ago, mom is now automatically the owner, notwithstanding the fact that we haven't recorded dad's death certificate at the registry yet. That's okay. But when mom died earlier this year, that house was now just in her name. It was owned individually and by virtue of her husband's death. When he died 10 years ago, it's ever since then it's been in her name. So when she dies, it is now a probate asset as to her. So it may have started out as a non-probate asset because it was owned jointly, but when the first spouse dies, now it's an individually owned asset that upon the death of that second spouse will be part of her probate estate. So the kids will have to probate estate, her estate, in order to have the legal authority to do anything with that house, to sell it, to, to refinance it. Let's say one of the kids wants to move into the house or continue to live there, wants to buy out the siblings, before they can get financing, they have to, the, the, the estate has to be probated. Or let's say they just want to sell it on the open market and divide the proceeds three ways. Again, they have to probate mom's estate in order to have the legal authority to sell that house. So, um, so joint ownership of a home is one way to avoid probate, but the caveat being it only avoids probate upon the death of the first spouse. Once the first spouse dies, it's now a probate asset as to the second spouse. One way to work around this is to have a trust that owns the house. That way, when the first spouse dies, the surviving spouse continues to be the beneficiary of that trust and the occupant uh, of that house as long as they live. Upon the death of the second spouse, it would not have to go to probate because by virtue of being in a trust, by definition, it's a non-probate asset, and they would have most likely one of the kids named as the successor trustee right in the trust document. So all that's necessary at that point is for um, that child, the successor trustee, to call up a real estate agent, say, my parents had a home, it was in a trust that they set up, they were both trustees, they've both since passed, I'm now named the successor trustee, I've got the original trust document right here, Here's my driver's license proving that I am this person named in the document. And at that point, that, that child would have legal authority to sign a listing agreement with the realtor, put the house on the market and sell it and go to the closing and sign all the papers as the seller slash trustee. And then when they get a check from the, from the sell, sale of the house, they could deposit that into a bank account in the name of the trust and then turn around and distribute to their brothers and sisters or whoever the, however the trust says to divvy up the proceeds. So again, we're still on slide number five, um, uh, examples of non-probate assets. So joint, joint assets, or at least upon the death of the first owner, they're still, um, they're still non-probate. Uh, assets in a living trust don't go through probate. Life insurance don't go through probate unless, and that, that abandoned property, that life insurance policy, the $1,500 that was at, with the state treasurer, there was no name, there either was no named beneficiary on the policy, which by default it goes to the estate, or it was, um, 
or the estate was actually named, which is a mistake that I've only seen a couple of times. Um, so you want to make sure you name an individual or a trust as the beneficiary on your life insurance. But generally speaking, life insurance proceeds should not have to go through probate. 401ks, IRAs, uh, also non-probate. Uh, payable on death beneficiary, if you've got a bank account with this type of a designation, you might even see it on the bank st statement, some of your paperwork, it would say TOD or POD, t uh, transfer on death or payable on death. Those are non-probate. Examples of probate assets. Um, real estate that's held in the individual's name or after the death of the first spouse, which we talked about. Um, checking accounts and savings accounts generally do have to go through probate. They generally don't have a death beneficiary named. Um, certificates of deposit very often don't give you that option at the bank to name a beneficiary on there. Um, stock accounts, st individual stocks or bonds or mutual funds that are not in an IRA. You know, you can have investments like individual stocks, bonds, or mutual funds inside of an IRA account and that IRA account will, will have a death beneficiary. It's non-probate. However, you can also own those investments in a taxable account, what's sometimes called a brokerage account, where it's not inside of an IRA, it's just a regular taxable account, whatever money that that mutual fund earns, you report the taxes each year, those accounts generally don't allow you to name a death beneficiary. Um, so those would be probate assets. All right, so slide, oh, so, all right, so now we're at the end of the first section. We're a little bit behind, but that's okay because we talk, the stuff, a lot of stuff in the second section we've already addressed, but um, I'd like to open up for a few minutes of general questions now if you have any on probate. Yes. I do. Um, the, my lawyer told me that setting up a trust would involve more money than letting my estate go through probate under the new mass laws. Interesting. <laughs> Depen <laughs> That's kind of what I'm hearing here. It depends. I mean, I suppose. If I have beneficiaries assigned on everything, would that be the, a true spot? It, so, a couple of thoughts. Do you have a spouse? No. No. And you have ch do you have children? No. Okay. Uh, but you do have, uh, are you for, off the top of your head, if you can think of your various assets, like your house, do you own a home? Mm -hmm. You do. Um, do you know how the deed is titled? It's in my name only. Okay. That right there, and I know I'm, I said general questions only, but here I am, we're going, and, uh, um, oh, by the way, I'm sorry, I forgot to speak into the, repeat the question in the microphone I was instructed. I even got the note right here. Um, so the question was, if anyone couldn't hear it, um, was, um, is it cost effective to set up a trust? Or is it possible that in some cases, it's cheaper to allow your estate to go through probate? So I, I guess there's three parts of that. Um, so setting up a trust is more expensive than doing just a will. However, it's usually cheaper than probate, but it's more expensive than if, if your estate did, would not otherwise have to go through probate. In other words, with your home, if your home is in your name, it is going to have to go through probate. And I cannot imagine that um, doing a trust would be more expensive than probate. Um, it, it's just not the case. The only way I could think of it, and I've had this happen, if someone comes in and, and they say, I rent an apartment and I've got a checking account and a savings account. I've got one child, I got a son and he's joint owner on both my checking and savings accounts. And, and I want to talk to you about setting up a trust and I'll say, you know, there's really not, I mean, it's not that there's no need, but it's just the benefits um, are outweighed by the cost. Chances are you're not going to need it. You know, there, there's a lot of things that go into dis the discussion, but I would say you, you, those accounts would not have to go through probate. And you know, setting up a trust is certainly going to be. It might not be a bad idea to have a will in place just in case, which is relatively inexpensive. But I wouldn't advise a trust in that case. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's kind of like pay me now or pay me later. It's like it's either going to cost you more to set up what I call a trust-based plan with a, a living trust at its core. It's more expensive to set that up now um, than to do, say, 
just a will and a power of attorney, but it puts more money in your family's pocket on the back end. And some people say, you know what, I've provided enough for my kids, you know, while they're growing up. If they're going to get a little bit less money, that's fine. They can live with it. I just want to make sure that my money ends up where I want it to go. If they have to pay a little bit in legal fees, and it really, it would be your, your estate that pays the legal fees and the filing fees and all that. But, um, yeah, I mean, I can't, just the fact that you've got to publish in the newspaper and it costs $500 just to, just to publish for one day and $400 just to file um, and there can be other miscellaneous expenses there. You're almost at $1,000 there, not even counting the first dollar of legal fees, of actual attorney's fees to probate the estate. Whereas with the trust, you don't even need a lawyer. You could just simply, you know, the child or whoever it is, the trustee could simply, in, in your case, could call a realtor and say, I'm the successor trustee of a trust. Here's my photo ID. Here's a copy of the trust. And then they're off and running. So. Um, so I just I respectfully disagree with your lawyer on, lawyer on that. Um, yeah, oh, well, let's. A short question: um, Posting it in the newspaper does it have to be the Boston Globe or can it be a local paper? It, they tell the court will tell you. So um, you, at the time of filing, you ask them which paper, and like if it's in Southern Essex County, it's very often the Salem Evening News. Even if it's not in Salem, it could be in Danvers or Beverly, and still the Salem News. But the court will tell you which paper they want you to publish in. So it's not necessarily the Globe, unless they live in Boston proper, but it goes by, it's, it has to be a, a newspaper in the community. It has to be a print newspaper, not an on online only newspaper. So, yes? Uh, if one has a trust, would a pour over will cover most of slide six? Slide six. Yes. Now, and just, just to clarify though, Oh, I'm sorry. The question is, in regards to a pour-over will, which many people aren't familiar with that term, what that means is, usually with a will, you name what we call a natural person or persons as your beneficiaries. You name people as your beneficiaries. A pour-over will means that there is a trust that is named as the beneficiary under the will. So you've got this trust that may have nothing in it yet. It may be an empty shell sitting, waiting there to receive property, or it may already have property in it, like let's say the title to your house. It might have the deed to your house in the trust, but maybe you got a checking account over here in your name. And the, the pour over will says, upon my death, I order that my personal representative take my probate assets, in this case, this checking account, and, and basically pour it into my trust so that everything will be funneled through the trust. And there are some advantages to doing that. So a pour over will means that the um, the beneficiary under the will is a trust rather than a live a, a, a natural person a living person, and then so your question was having a having a pour over will into your trust. What was the the rest of the question? Will it cover most of what's listed for slide six? Okay, so by by cover, it won't avoid probate. Those assets still have to be probated because you've got a will. It still has to be filed with the court. You have to do everything that I already talked about with probate. All it does is it means that the ultimately those assets will get to the beneficiaries via the trust rather than a straight shot through the will. So, um, and I'll, I'll just I'll jump a little bit ahead here because this is appropriate to some of the future discussion about trust. Um, so you still have to you would still have to go through probate with those assets. It doesn't avoid probate. So by covering it, it just simply means that those assets would end up in the trust. However, if you want to totally avoid probate, you want to get those assets in the trust while you're still alive. If you don't get them in the trust while you're still alive, the pour over will simply instructs your personal rep to put those assets into your trust after your death. But they can't do that until they probate the estate. So and I, I could tell by your reaction, when you say cover, you mean, does it avoid probate? The answer is no. However, there is still benefit to having that done, even if... Shut up. Um, so I, I'll give you a, a couple of examples. Um, if you have kids and they're married and, and you're worried about there's a 50% divorce rate, and that's even under the best of circumstances. You know, what if you don't like your daughter-in-law or son-in-law? You know, we call them the outlaws, not the in-laws. And, and you're concerned about, my God, what if, if, if my son or daughter inherits from me and they subsequently get divorced, 
th that money that I work so hard for is going to end up, part of it is going to end up with that f ex son or daughter in law, and that's the last thing I want. Well, when that son or daughter inherits directly through a will, directly from the will, that is a marital asset. That check from the personal representative is made payable to them, and the moment they deposit that, it is a marital asset and it's subject to division in the divorce. Whereas if it funnels through a trust first, the trust, if it's well drafted, will have something called the spendthrift provision, which prevents any creditors of that child from reaching their beneficial interest under the trust. It basically says if, they're, if paying this money over to little Johnny will result in his ex-wife getting any of it, the trustee may exercise their discretion and keep that money in the trust until the divorce is finalized and then little Johnny can get his inheritance. And, and the ex-daughter-in-law's lawyer can't do a thing about it cannot force the trustee to give Johnny his money now. He's got to wait until the trustee knows that the coast is clear and the divorce has been settled and, and all that. So even though a pour over will does go through probate, there are advantages to receiving that inheritance through the trust. And I'm picturing a fun, this is a funnel, by the way. So picturing, it, so the money would go through the trust and get to them that way rather than directly through the will. Um, so, or another example is if you've got grandchildren and you don't want them to, let's say if, uh, you don't, if they're, they're in their 20s or their teens, you don't want them to inherit a lump sum of money, which under a will they would. As soon as they turn 18, that's their money. In a trust, you can say any beneficiaries who haven't reached these certain age markers, they get a portion when they turn 22, a portion at 25, a portion at 28. So the trustee, maybe their aunt or uncle says, um, okay, you know, the trust says that I can pay for you to take music lessons. I can pay for your private school. I can pay for your school clothes. Um, but as for having access to cash, that's, you don't get a say in it until you hit 22. And then you can have a third of what we've set aside for you in the trust. Uh, and then another third when you hit, you know, 25 or whatever the next age marker is. So that's another example of something that you can do with a trust uh, that you can't do with a will, um, and why a pour over will is a good idea. When it, most of the time, when you've got a trust, you generally want to have a will as a backup, kind of like batting cleanup, you know, the, the fourth batter bats cleanup. That's the way I think of a, a pour over will. It's batting cleanup in case there are any, any um, orphaned accounts over here that don't have a joint owner that were not put into the trust while my client was alive at least we've got the will that says that account upon my client's death gets put into the trust um, and so it's it's helpful for the beneficiaries um, so um, any other questions on probate yes could you repeat that Good question. Uh, the question is, um, uh, how difficult is it for um, a trustee or a personal representative, for that matter, to administer an estate or a trust if they live outside of Massachusetts? The answer is not terribly difficult. I've done it on many occasions, especially with technology and communications being what they are today, with email and scanning and PDFs and fax and FedEx overnight and everything else. Um, it's really not that bad. Um, I've had clients who live out of state, who live in Florida, who live in California, who um, uh, most recently, I just wrapped up in a state where the, they live in Cleveland, Ohio, and, um, um, and everything was just done by a, via phone and email and snail mail, and, and um, it's very doable. So, um, you know, I think just you want to choose somebody who is reasonably intelligent. They don't have to have any technical knowledge of this stuff because as I said, it's mostly the lawyer who's doing the legwork. They just need to be trustworthy and, you know, and be reasonably, reasonably organized and, and so that they can work effectively with the attorney and, and communicate with them, answer questions, sign documents as needed. So, um, yeah, we don't all, I mean, sometimes our families scatter all over the place and we don't have someone necessarily who lives in the same town who can take care of this stuff. So if, if think more about the individual rather than where they live, that's an, a hurdle that's easily overcome.
Uh, any other questions? Yes. Just a quick one on the probatable assets. If they're held jointly, then no probate, like joint bank accounts or Correct. Okay. But only, but, so the question was, uh, do joint assets avoid, avoid probate, like let's say with a spouse or with a, or with a child for that matter? Yeah. They, they, they do, do more, spouse more spouse. So, and, and I would be even more concerned with that because, it, you know, you got two people are generally the same age. Um, you know, a child may not die for, say, 30 years after the parents. Right. So we're not worried so much about that scenario. More, more of spouses. Um, so upon the first spouse's death, no probate, but when after the spur, first spouse dies, it then becomes a probate asset of the, of the surviving spouse. So it's, the answer is yes and no. No at first, but then yes, it does become a probate asset. Okay, thank you. Yes. If IRAs are not part of probate, are they part of the, um, what you get taxed on? They are, good question. So question is, uh, is the money in an IRA account even though, and you point out a very a, an interesting legal distinction because there are you've got your probate estate and you've got your taxable estate, two different concepts. Um, so, um, I'm sorry, I just had a, drew a blank, like a little under the weather. So repeat the so the question again. IRA. Are they part of the taxable? Okay. When you talk about having over a million dollars, I think we're, I'm part of the generation. Yes, and so it is, so it, the IRA money is subject to Massachusetts estate tax, um, and a lot of times uh, the kids are, um, get, have a little, get a little shock, you know, they're, they're, they're a little taken by surprise because um, they keep, they've thought all the way along that, oh, it's an IRA, it's tax-free, or there is no tax to be paid. Well, it's true that there's, the income tax is deferred or tax-free, and um, but the estate tax is a different thing. So, and you're right, this, this generation that's retiring now is the first one to have sizable IRA accounts. The generation before all had pensions. They really didn't have a lot of savings. They didn't need it. This generation does, and they, they do have IRA money, and that does go into the pot in determining the value of your gross estate. So you add your house, a life insurance policy, your bank accounts, your IRA balances, all those things are stacked on, up on each other, and if they come to a million or more, then that's a, a taxable estate for Massachusetts purposes. You, at a minimum, would have to file a, a Massachusetts estate tax return. The estate may or may not actually owe any taxes depending on what deductions get taken off that, because you get to deduct out <coughs> your, your, your debts. So, so yes, uh, the IRAs are subject to estate tax. What about 529s? Is that a way to avoid having them part of your estate if they're for the benefit of your grandchildren or children or I mean, college I, funds? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I want to say no, they're not part of it, and simply because uh, now the owner can cash out those policy, those accounts, and they pay a, t a penalty and they would pay taxes if it's not used for someone's education expenses. So by virtue of that, I would say, yes, they, um, they are taxable because the account owner would be able to access that money. However, on the other hand, there is a strategy that I've heard of where people can make an accelerated gift, like five years worth of gifts. Right now, there's a $15,000 a year federal gift tax exclusion. So you can give $75,000 to one of your grandkids' 529 plan and do basically do five years' worth of non-taxable gifting. So I would say, and because the gift tax and the federal, the federal gift tax and estate tax are tied together, uh, I would say that that money is out of the gifter's estate. Uh, but all that being, take that with a grain of salt. You'd want to check on your CPA. I mean, I, I, I do know a bit about tax law, but, um, you know, you'd want to follow up with your accountant on that, uh, about the 529 specifically. So, okay, so let's, uh, we'll move on to the next section, estate planning documents. And this will be much quicker because we already talked about a lot of this stuff. Um, slide number nine. Does having a will allow my estate to avoid probate? 
Um, we've already established that that's not the case, that you can have a will and still in your estate would still have to go through probate depending on your assets and how they're owned. Um, let me, uh, Carla, how many uh, minutes should I set this one for to get back on track? Oh, okay. We have to be done by 3.30. All right, so this will be a quick segment. So this will be like a 10-minute segment and five minutes questions. Okay. All right, so um, what a will does is it, it allows you to call certain shots. To, it allows you to dictate who is going to be in charge of your estate, who receives your assets. Um, if, there, if you have a child that you want to disinherit, you would have to have a will in order to do it, um, which is more common than you think. Uh, I'm actually working on that right now for, for a client, and um, you know, it's unfortunate. But, uh, but it does happen for a variety of reasons. Um, and let's see. So, uh, you know, a will does not have any legal effect until it is filed with the appropriate court. So, so again, having the will in and of itself doesn't uh, avoid probate. And when you think about it, the will doesn't become active or, or live, so to speak, unless and until it's filed with the probate court. So at that point, you are in probate. So. So the answer to that is um, a big fat no. So it's a playbook for the court to follow. Um, you know, there are other advantages to having a will because uh, you can give your personal representative certain authority, certain powers, and which makes things much easier for the person administering the estate. For instance, if you own a home, it's very useful to have a will. I mean, the best case scenario would be to have a trust most likely uh, to avoid probate altogether, but if your estate is going to have to go through probate and you own a house, your house is one of those probate assets, you definitely want to have a will because um, without the will, you have to get what's well, your personal representative would have to get something called a license to sell, which um, is a major pain in the butt. Um, it takes a lot of extra time and money going back and forth to court before the personal representative actually has the legal authority to sell the real estate. Whereas if you have a will, um, and I've seen wills that don't actually have this, and it's like almost like not having a will, they're just poorly drafted, um, it has to specifically state that the personal rep has the authority to sell real estate owned by the decedent. If that's the case, they can sell the property and go to the closing and the, the, uh, the title agent, there's always a title agent involved when there's financing, title agent is going to want to know that the seller has the authority to sell. If not, they're going to have to get a license to sell and, and having a will uh, eliminates that need. Another thing is uh, having surety on the, on the bond, which a technical thing, but it's one tiny little thing that by the difference between having a will and not having a will can make a world of difference for the person that's dealing with the estate. Um, and let's see, we are on to slide number 10. Um, and we talked about this a little. What does having a will allow you to do? Distribute your, your property according to your wishes, including disinheritance. We mentioned that. Who gets what? Um, choosing, if you have minor children, um, choosing a guardian for them if you die while they're still under the age of 18. Pouring assets into your trust for continued management. That's a pour over will. Um, appointing your personal representative, license to sell real estate, waiving surety on the bond. So see, we already talked about all that. So we're already on to 11. How can we avoid probate? Um, you know, one way is, you know, make sure that your various accounts have a death beneficiary name. Like if you have an IRA, double check. Make sure that you've got your beneficiaries in order. If it's a bank account, go to your bank and say, do I have the option with these accounts to have a TOD or a POD? You may or may not. Um, you may consider adding um, a child or a spouse as a joint owner on an account. Again, that's a way to um, avoid probate, at least upon the death of the first joint owner. Um, another way to do it is to set up a trust, whether it's a revocable or an irrevocable trust, depending on the circumstances, depending on what you're trying to achieve. Um, and there are all kinds of uh, things that can inform the decision of whether to go with the revocable or an irrevocable trust, so um, which are beyond the scope of the scope of this discussion. 
but um, uh, I'm sure that some of you have heard that, you know, of revocable versus irrevocable trust. So, you know, and it's not, there is no general rule of thumb. It requires an analysis of each situation to decide ultimately whether it makes sense. Um, sometimes it's almost, a, you do the analysis and it's a no brainer. The, the answer just jumps right out. Other times it's like, it could go either way. There are pros and cons to doing either one. So you just, uh, you know, the client ultimately makes the call, the judgment call, the, the, yeah, I want this or I want that. Um, so, um, so that's another way to avoid probate is to set up a, a living trust and, um, and putting those assets into it. So what is a trust? A couple of ways to think of it. One is that it's an agreement or a contract be between the person creating the trust, who is called the donor, and the person who will manage the trust property, who's called the trustee, and that trustee is managing it for the benefit of one or more individuals called the beneficiaries. Now, someone can wear two or even one, two, or all three of those hats. I could set up a trust, so I would be the donor, I'm creating the trust. I could also appoint myself as the initial trustee. I could also appoint myself as the initial beneficiary for as long as I live. And upon my death, my kids could be the successor uh, the contingent beneficiaries, uh, and I could name uh, you know any number of people as the successor trustee or trustees. So you could that you can wear multiple hats there. Uh, another way to think of a trust is it's like a it's like a vessel or a bucket with a well let's say this it's like this bottle of water. The trust is the container. Um, the label is the the written instructions uh, on how the the property is to be managed and to, for whose benefit it's being managed and then the water is the assets that go into it the you know the accounts the the, the real estate that sort of thing ah, tasty assets okay so um <clears throat> so that's basically what a trust is and and the different pe the different parties that are involved and some of the terminology um so a uh, Slide number 13, kind of talked about that, who can be the donor, the trustee, the beneficiary. Just a quick little note, if you're doing a revocable living trust, generally my clients will serve as their own trustee. As long as they're alive and as long as they're mentally competent, they can be their own trustee and manage all the property in the trust for their own benefit. It's only upon their incapacity, let's say they have, they have a stroke and they're no longer able to handle their affairs. They could have a child or a brother or sister, whoever they've named, it could be a good friend. It could be a lawyer or an accountant. It usually isn't, it's usually a lay person. Um, but whoever you name, you name, they could automatically step in as, as trustee and take over if you become disabled and are un unable to do it. You would still be the beneficiary, but you wouldn't be involved in the day-to-day -day, um, management of the trust. And um, uh, let's see, uh, types of trusts, slide number 14. Uh, testamentary versus living. So a living trust is simply a trust that you create while you're still above ground. There's nothing more special to it than that. Um, sometimes people will say they hear from a friend, a little bit of information is a, a dangerous thing. You know, be wary of listening to friends or whatever you read on the internet or hear from your lawyer. Um, uh, you know, that, uh, oh, I heard you have to have a living trust. It's important to have a living trust. Well, there really is nothing special about a living trust. It just simply refers to a trust that you create while you're alive. A testamentary trust is created by and within your will after your death. It's created by the court, essentially. It's supervised by the court. I'm not a fan of testamentary trusts. I don't do them um, because one of the biggest benefits of a trust is avoiding probate by putting assets into it. And a testamentary trust by its own definition, doesn't even get created until you probate the estate. So you basically, you would have a will that, in addition to everything else the will says, it also says, oh, by the way, set up a trust after I'm dead. It's like, well, what's the point? You kind of missed the bus on that. So um, testamentary trust, in, in my opinion, are a complete waste of time and money. Um, and then there's, of course, revocable versus irrevocable. And there are a, a variety of irrevocable trust that are done for, for various reasons. Um, and there are a handful of different variations of revocable trust. So other benefits of trust, some of these things we've talked about, um, more flexibility than making outright gifts. Um, so you can change the beneficiaries. If you put, if you put somebody as a joint owner on an account, 
and you change your mind and they're not willing to go along with it, it's too late. You've already made them a joint donor. They, own, they now own half that account. And for that matter, they could clean out the entire account. They can, they can walk into the bank and empty it at any, any time. That's what a joint donor is. So there's some risk there. Um, and um, you know, creditor protection for, for your future beneficiaries. Again, the, the divorce, the, the, the outlaws, the son-in-law, the daughter-in-law. Um, it lawsuits. If, if one of them is, is, is potentially going to be involved in a lawsuit, if they're a business owner, if they've got into a car accident, if they're getting sued by somebody, um, their inheritance would be up for grabs by any, any person suing them if, they, if their money is not coming to them through a trust. Um, it's cheaper to, and to your point, it's cheaper to administer a trust than a probate estate. It's private. So um, nothing gets filed with the court, so nobody can go in and take a look at it. And now it's starting to be online. Probate, this just happened within the past month. Um, you can now go and view newer dockets in the probate court online. You sign up for a login, you can go in and see all the paperwork and see what a person had. With a trust, it doesn't get filed with the court, so it's private. Um, administering a trust is quicker. It's a quicker way to distribute the inheritance than with the probate estate. Um, you can make staged or conditional distributions. Maybe this child, this grandchild doesn't get anything unless they finish a bachelor's degree. Um, this child doesn't get anything until they reach age 25. Those sorts of things that you cannot do with a will. It's also harder to challenge or object to a trust than it is with a will. Um, so, you know, you may have heard of will contest or a probate contest when a will is filed and somebody is disgruntled, this disinherited child, or maybe they get le they're getting less than their siblings and they want to challenge it. It's easier, again, for technical reasons I won't get into today, but it's easier to challenge a will and throw a monkey wrench into the works than it is with a trust. Um, slide 16. Um, do you know who will manage your finances during your lifetime if you are unable to do so? How do you give someone the legal authority to act? Now, this is assuming that you either don't have a trust or you have assets. Maybe you have a trust, but you have assets that are not in it. So um, that's where a power of, power of attorney will come in place. So let's say you had the aforementioned stroke and you're unable to pay your bills on time. If you have a durable power of attorney in place, you can designate somebody to be able to access your bank accounts for purposes of paying your bills on time. Because um, hopefully you'll recover from your stroke, which people often do, and you don't want to come back to a mess. You don't want to find out that your financial life has fallen apart while you're, you're in rehab recovering from your stroke and doing occupational therapy and physical therapy, and then you come back and you get this big mess. Uh, so that's what a, a durable power of attorney will do for you. And it's a simple document. It's, you know, pretty inexpensive to execute, and it's a heck of a lot better than um, a loved one having to get a guardianship over you, which is the alternative. If you don't have a durable power of attorney, they would have to get a guardianship in order to act on your behalf when it comes to legal and financial matters. Um, and then finishing up this, this section, uh, the difference between a health care proxy and a living will. So this is like a durable power of attorney, but it's for health care decisions. Um, so in Massachusetts, we don't use living wills, or I shouldn't say that they are not legally recognized by a doctor or by a court. It's helpful to have them, but what a living will is, you write your wishes on a piece of paper, and if you were in a different state that does have living wills, someone in your family, doesn't matter who, could simply hand that document to your health care provider. If you're in the hospital, and let's say um, you went in for surgery and you haven't woken up, and um, and the doctors need to know, you know, can we insert a feeding tube through the through the belly button? You know, what uh, there's some kind of uh, there's some kind of procedure that we would like to uh, conduct, but we need authorization to do it. They would in a different state, not Massachusetts, where they have living wills. The doctor would follow the written instructions. In Massachusetts, it has to be a living, breathing person who gives those instructions to the doctor. And the way to do that is with a healthcare proxy document. Um, you also want to make sure that um, there is HIPAA authorization language in that healthcare proxy. HIPAA is the, the federal medical records privacy law. 
that has doctors shaking in their boots. They don't want to breach privacy and get sued when their client wakes up from a coma. So you want to make sure that that HIPAA language is in there. And it's the form that you get from the doctor doesn't always contain that HIPAA language. So you want to have a separate HIPAA authorization so that when your healthcare agent needs to make a decision and convey it to your doctor uh, at the hospital, um, you want to make sure that the hospital has that in their file so that they're able to talk about your case, your, your medical file, with your healthcare agent so they can make an informed decision. So in, like I said, in Massachusetts, we use a healthcare proxy, which is a document that you sign and, and have witnessed, and it appoints a living, breathing person to make these decisions on your behalf to your healthcare providers. Um, any general questions on the, the legal documents? Yes. There is a form called the MOLST, which mm -hmm. is a written form which will allow you to write down what you want. Yeah, there is. And it's, it's a relatively new thing. It hasn't supplanted the healthcare proxy yet, so we're still using the healthcare proxy. Um, but the MOLST is, yeah, I, again, and I still do healthcare proxies, I don't do MOLST forms until they change the statute. As I understand it, I mean, the doctors will follow it, but it maybe at some point it will replace the healthcare proxy or work alongside it, but hasn't hasn't happened yet. So. What was that name of the form? Oh, I'm sorry. It's called the the MOLST, and I, I could it's M O L S T. If you I, and I couldn't tell you what it stands for, um, but uh, if you want to Google it and learn a little bit more about it. Uh, I believe the state does have a uh, does have it on one of the one of its websites to tell you a little bit about it. Maybe you can download the forms. Uh, yes. Oh, okay. So uh, a revocable trust means that it can be changed. So revocable. Technically, the question is the difference between a revocable and irrevocable trust. Um, a revocable trust, to revoke it means to cancel it, to void it, to destroy it, and take back any property or assets that you would put into the trust. That's generally not done. Um, it's pretty rare to actually revoke a trust. If anything, you would just take the assets back. If it's a revocable trust, you have full access to whatever's in the trust, so you would just take those assets back out. If you had deeded your home into the trust, you would simply deed it from yourself as trustee back to yourself as an individual, and that's how you would get the property out. And you would just leave the trust as an empty shell. There's, uh, there's often no need to actually revoke it. You would just empty it out and leave it there to, sly, to die a slow death. Um, and um, an irrevocable, tr and well, more commonly, when revocable, even though technically it means to void or destroy the trust, what it usually means in a practic practical sense is it's amendable. It's able to be amended. And those happen quite often. Um, you can amend the trust as many times as you want. You can change the beneficiaries. You can change the trustees. You can change where the trust property goes after you die. All kinds of things that you can change on the trust. So that's a revocable trust. An irrevocable trust simply means you can't do it. You can't amend it and you can't revoke it and you can't take the property back out. It's like a black hole. Things go in, they don't come back out. Um, and there are reasons for that, So, which we'll get to next. Um, so now we're on to, yes? A living trust, that, would that be the same thing as an irrevocable trust? Yes. Um, uh, an irrevocable trust is a subset of living trust. It's a type of living trust. Okay. Yeah. And in fact, I mean, I, I actually have seen recently a testamentary trust that became irrevocable, but that's pretty unusual. Uh, usually they're living trusts. Um, so, um, slide 19, elder law, long-term care and Medicaid planning. So, this is, if you need to go into a skilled nursing facility and you've exhausted your other options, you know, plan A would be to stay at home as long as you can. Um, stay physically and mentally fit. You know, the work that they do here at People Fit is a good example of that. Um, you know, the, I know that, uh, well, um, and I guess Carla could back this up. I'm speaking out of turn a little bit, but I believe that the biggest cause of falls is not a lack of balance, it's lack of strength. Um, am I correct on that? Yes? Oh, good. So, um, 
so, you know, being physically fit, staying strong, resistance training is a good way to prevent falls, which is when it comes to the physical, and again, I'm going on a limb here, but from what I understand, falls are one of the leading causes of people having to go into a nursing home because the fall uh, causes a broken bone, which upon discharge from the hospital, they go to rehab. Rehab can sometimes turn into a long-term situation if they're not well enough to go home. So, um, so weakness followed by a fall, a broken bone, rehab, can, that can lead to ultimate, ultimately um, a long-term long care situation in a skilled nursing facility, which you'd like to avoid, obviously. Um, another thing is uh, cognitive decline. So dementia, Alzheimer's, um, anything that it makes, it, uh, makes it dangerous for, for the person to remain at home alone. Um, any number of things can happen, whether it's, um, you know, they, well, they could certainly fall and not be able to call for help, or um, leaving the house and, and wandering, especially in cold weather, um, you know, people can die of exposure. I mean, people will, with, with these diseases will leave the house in the middle of January without a coat and not realize what they're doing, and putting themselves in harm's way. Um, so, so again, the idea is to stay at home as long as possible, um, and then uh, maybe if staying at home isn't possible, you might consider assisted living. If that doesn't provide the level of care that you need, um, then you would want to look at skilled nursing. And then it's a question of, okay, if clinically this is what makes the most sense, the next question is how do we pay for it? Well, there are three ways that you pay for skilled nursing in, a, in an inpatient facility. Private pay, which is cash out of pocket, um, and the cost can vary, but, you know, it could be anywhere from $10,000 a month on up, depending on the facility. Um, then there's long-term care insurance. And, you know, many people don't have long-term care insurance. Either they don't qualify for it, it's too expensive, or by the time people think, start thinking about it, they're at an age where the premiums would be cost prohibitive. Um, although there are solutions to that nowadays, there are hybrid life insurance slash long-term care policies where you where um, you don't have that use it or lose it feature of traditional long-term care policies. Well, what if I never go into a nursing home? I paid all this money in premiums, didn't even use the benefit. Well, the answer to that is now you can have a life insurance policy with a long-term care rider. So you can eat into part of your death benefit while you're still alive to pay for these costs so you don't have to use up your nest egg in paying for it. Um, and then finally, there's um, qualifying for Medicaid, which is uh, it just, first of all, it's distinguished from Medicare. Medicare, you automatically qualify for at age 65. It's not based on your economic need, and it pays for your doctor's visits, hospital visits, and prescription drugs. It will not pay for a nursing home. Medicare will pay for short-term stints in a nursing home, up to 100 days in theory, usually much less than that. That's when, um, once Medicare stops paying, you have to see if you can you either pay privately or long-term care if you, insurance, if you have it, or try to qualify for Medicaid, which in Massachusetts we refer to as MassHealth. Medicaid is the name of the federal program. There are Medicaid regulations that Congress, that Congress writes, um, but they don't administer the program. All they do is distribute funding to the individual states. The states then have their own programs. They add their own regulations on top of the federal ones that can be more or less restrictive than the federal ones and the states contribute money to the program as well and so when you apply you go to a nursing home and you apply for Medicaid you're actually applying um, to the state government not the federal and you're applying to mass health not Medicaid so um, <clears throat> so we'll talk a little bit about Medicaid eligibility uh, let's see we talked every, about everything on slide number 20. All right, slide number 21. So there's eligibility, um, you know, uh, medical and financial need. So medical need, um, you either need to have a, a diagnosis of dementia or some kind of cognitive decline, which automatically gives you, it makes you um, uh, clinically eligible for, for Medicaid. Um, or if you have a physical, um, uh, physical problem, there, you need to be diagnosed as having, needing help with two ADLs. That stands for activities of daily living. So um, getting in and out of bed, getting to the bathroom, 
um, dressing, bathing, eating, those types of things, activities of daily living. If you need help with at least two of those things, you qualify medically for, for Medicaid or Mass Health. Then they look at your financial need. They look at your assets and your income. Now, you, the, the person who's in the nursing home, whatever income they have coming in, whether it's through Social Security, a pension, that all has to go to the nursing home minus a paltry $72 a month or something that you get to keep and set aside in a little account that the nursing home keeps for you. But all of your income goes straight to the nursing home as your copayment. Medicaid picks up the rest. Um, if it's a married couple, the nursing home spouse has to have all their income go to the nursing home. The community spouse, as they're called, does not have to pay any of their individual income to the nursing home. They get to keep that to live on. Uh, they also look at assets. The asset limit for the nursing home applicant is $2,000. If they're married, they also look at the community spouse. There's something called the CSRA, Community Spouse Resource Allowance, which right now is up to $123,000. So in addition to the family home, um, you would want to get the, the house out of the name of the nursing home spouse and into just the community spouse's name. So the community spouse is allowed to have the, the, the home plus $123,000. And then you get into further questions of, well, what happens if the, the community spouse has more than $123,000? Depends on how much more. Um, there's this, the five-year look-back period for making gifts, whether it's from the community spouse or from the, the nursing home spouse any gifts that they make to the kids are going to be subject to a five-year look-back period and the value of those gifts is going to trigger a corresponding pe uh, penalty period where the person is ineligible for benefits based on the amount of money that they gave away so um, so that's why timing on this is important if you can do stuff ahead of time and get around that five-year look-back period that's ideal um, but there are also things that can be done if no planning has been done. Let's say, for instance, um, uh, wife goes into a nursing home. We've got everything out of her name. Everything is in the husband's name, the house, the assets. But maybe they have $200,000. He's allowed to have 123. So he is, what, 77, am I right? $77,000 over the limit. He can purchase a Medicaid qualifying annuity turning that 77,000 in countable asset and converting it into a non-countable stream of income payable to him. So it's a way for his wife to still qualify for mass health without him having to spend that $77,000 down by paying privately to the nursing home. He can get her on mass health now and still have the benefit of receiving income from that $77,000 with the Medicaid annuity. So that's a strategy that, that a couple could use um, if no planning was done in advance. Um, they could also set up an irrevocable trust. They could deed the house into the trust. After five years, if the trust was drafted properly, um, the house would not be counted as an asset for either one of them because when you're doing this planning, you don't know if either one is going to go into a nursing home, and if so, which one is going to go first. So this way you don't have to worry about it. As long as it's done five years ahead of time and, the, and it's a, a, a trust that was drafted properly, um, then uh, it's not going to be a countable asset. So uh, another thing is estate recovery. This is uh, back on slide 21. We talk about eligibility and estate recovery. So eligibility is the front end right now here today take let's take a snapshot of what you have would you be eligible for Medicaid you can be eligible for Medicaid but still not be home free they can still go after your estate after your death so let's take a very simple example let's say we have a man a single guy owns a home and he has two thousand dollars to his name so he's he He's under the $2,000 limit for assets. He's allowed to have a personal residence and still qualify for mass health as long as he intends to return to the home, which when filling out the application, he would indicate that by checking a box. I intend to return home, even if he really doesn't. Goes into a nursing home, he would qualify for mass health. Mass health would pay his bill. The advantage to this by qualifying for Medicaid He's getting a discount on his nursing uh, cost because instead of paying the full price of $10,000 a month, 
he's getting billed at the mass health rate, which is about $6,000 a month. So he's saving $4,000 right there. Not only that, but let's say he has $2,000 a month in income. That $2,000 goes to the nursing home as his co-payment, but Mass Health is paying the other $4,000. So upon his death, there will be a lien against his estate and against his house, but it will only be based on the fact that Mass Health was paying $4,000 a month uh, for his care. So if he had decided to not even apply for Mass Health, he would have paid privately $10,000 a month directly to the nursing home and burned through. And again, and let's, in this example, he only had $2,000, but let's say, um, let's say he took out a reverse mortgage or a home equity or something like that, or maybe he sold his house. Some people will do that. They, un will, they unknowingly will sell their house thinking that um, they have to do that to qualify for Medicaid. They'll sell the house, go into a nursing home, pay privately until that money is gone, and then apply for Medicaid. Well, in that scenario, that gentleman would be paying $10,000 a month up front in cash to the nursing home, whereas if he could have qualified for Mass Health, he could have got a lower rate on his room, say $6,000 instead of $10,000 a month, and only had to pay back what Mass Health paid on his behalf. So the lien, let's say if he spent a year in the nursing home before he died, that's 12 months times $4,000 a month, that's $48,000 that would have to be paid back to Mass Health from the sale of his house upon his death. They would go after his estate. His estate, his personal representative, would pay the Mass Health lien of $48,000, and then they're all good. They're free and clear. And whatever's left gets divided among the heirs of the estate. Whereas if he had spent a, a year in the nursing home paying privately, he would have spent $120,000. And again, under this example, some people will, will unwittingly think that they have to sell their house um, and then take the proceeds and pay until it's all gone before they can apply for mass health, and that's simply not the case. Um, and ideally, if the house were put into an irrevocable trust at least five years ahead of time, not only would, would it not be a countable asset at the time that he's seeking benefits, it would not be subject to a state recovery after his death. So you ha when you approach this, you have to look at it from the front end and the back end. What, what do I need to do to be eligible today? And is my estate going to be subject to a state recovery on the back end? Is Mass Health going to want to get reimbursed after my death? And how much is that going to leave for my family? It could eat up the entire estate. You know, I mentioned that, that estate, there was a $315,000 lien. Luckily, <laughs> The house had been put into a trust. They couldn't go after the house, but if there ever were, were a probate estate in the future, which there was when he tried to cash in that $1,500 life insurance policy, they're going to have a lien against that money. So that's an extreme example, but it helps illustrate the point. Um, let's see. I think we're – anything else that I want to add? And we ran – not too bad, only five minutes over. Um, okay. Yeah, we talked about the $2,000 limit, uh, married couples, the, the community spouse resource allowance of 123. Slide 24, um, I won't uh, bother, I mean, you can just read this for yourself, but these are non-countable assets for eligibility purposes. Again, you're allowed to have $2,000, you're allowed to have a primary residence um, with up to uh, over $800,000 in equity, and it won't count against you for eligibility, but depending on whether the home is in your name or if it's in an irrevocable trust, um, there may or may not be a state recovery afterwards. Um, they don't count your personal property, your jewelry, things like that. You're allowed to have one vehicle of, of reasonable value. Um, you can do a prepaid funeral plan, which I highly recommend. Uh, if you have a funeral home that you trust and, and your family has used in the past, it's a good idea to go and pay for that. What will, it's going to be an ultimate expense for all of us anyway. You know, while you've got the money, you can pay for it now. And because you're not giving that money away, you're getting something in return. It's not a gift. Therefore, it's not subject to the five-year look-back period. It's a way to get you know, roughly $10,000 out of your name legally and quickly. Um, and then there's another thing that's a little known tidbit is this $1,500 irrevocable burial account. You can go to your bank and tell them that you want to set up a $1,500 burial account, explain that, you know, why you're, that you're doing it for Medicaid purposes. They should understand that and know exactly what type of account you need. 
basically you would name an authorized person who is able to withdraw that money and close the account only upon your death. So it's not a passbook account or a statement account where you, there's no checks. It's just it's a one-time withdrawal upon your death. A designated person that you've named can go in there with the death certificate to the bank, close out the account, and use that money for any miscellaneous expenses associated with with um, you know your um, you know your funeral, your wake, flowers, you know flying in family from out of town, whatever it is. It could be used for anything. Mass Health doesn't question that um, as long as it's designated as a burial account. So that's an, so that's in addition to the two thousand dollars that you're allowed to have in your name. Um, and then life insurance, if you have cash value life insurance, like whole life or universal life and there's cash value, there's a limit to how much cash value you can have. So that's something that you would want to address before applying for mass health. You'd want to make sure that um, you withdraw money out of that policy to get the cash value below $1,500. Uh, and then slide number 25, um, your income goes to the nursing home. Um, and you get the $72 uh, personal needs allowance, and the rest of it is your copayment. And again, the spouse, the community spouse, gets to keep all of his or her income for themselves. That does not have to go to pay the nursing care of the nursing home spouse. So any uh, general questions on um, Medicaid and elder law? Yes. So slide 22, look at, you talk about that? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's, it's more trivial than anything. It's, um, it's just simply, and this changes, there haven't been any changes in the law for quite a while. I hear a lot from people who will say, Oh, I heard, isn't the look back seven years now, or isn't it 10 years, or um, it's been five years for, for over a decade now. I don't know where the legislation is going to go in the future. They may increase the look back period to seven years, 10 years. It used to be three years, uh, three or five, depending on whether you were making an outright gift or a gift to a trust, but those rules don't matter anymore anyway, because it, it's been more than five years, so... Um, so there's no more sliding scale involved. It's just a five-year look back uh, across the across the board. You give, you give money away this year and next year and the next year, and then you, then the fourth year you go to apply for Medicaid, they're going to look back and say you've given your money away. Yes. So if you did it all in one one lump sum, that's an easy example. It's like you know, if any time within the next five years you apply for Mass Health, um, they're going to look at that. They're going to look at the bank statement and say, what was this ten thousand dollars that you made? And you're going to say, oh, that was a you know, gift to my son. They're going to say, can you get that money back or did he spend it? And if you can get it back, either way, you're going to have to pay privately for a, a penalty period. Um, and uh, if you make successive gifts, in your example, um, each year you do, say, $10,000, each gift starts a five-year clock ticking as to that particular gift. So your most recent gift was last year there's a five-year clock ticking as for that particular gift so so you have to be aware of that as well but this just applies to med medicaid correct it, correct mm -hmm. right. okay. Qu yep. again your house when you, when you put it into a trust it's kind of like protected from, from that but does it have to be an irrevocable trust yes and, and the, so the question is in order to protect a home from nursing home expenses, does it have to be in an irrevocable trust? And the answer is yes. The only exception to that is I had a, a young couple, younger couple that I'm working with right now where I don't think it makes sense. They're in their 50s and I, they wanted to do an irrevocable trust. I think it's too early for that. There's too much runway where the law could change between now and the time it's being implemented. So, so uh, I would rather not lock it up in an irrevocable trust right now. They also have a mortgage on the house, and if they put it into an irrevocable trust, they can't refinance because once the house goes into the trust, they can't take it back out to refinance the way you can with a revocable trust. You can pull with a revocable, you can pull the house out, refinance it, put it back into the trust, where you can't do that with an irrevocable. Now, this particular couple, they're still concerned about nursing home uh, expenses. They can always wait until they're older. And then we can revisit the idea of an irrevocable trust at the time. And we could transfer the house out of their revocable into a new re irrevocable trust that we set up. And in the meantime, if one of them needs to go into a nursing home prior to that, 
um, I explained what we can do is we can always um, get one of their names off that revocable trust and into just the name of the community spouse. So just like if, if we had husband and wife own a house as, jointly, wife needs to go to a nursing home, we can deed her half of the house out of her name and just over to her husband. And um, so, and there's no, so this is an important thing too. I'm glad you mentioned that or else I wouldn't have thought to segue into this. The five year look back period does not, uh, does not apply to transfers of assets between spouses. There's no dollar limit, any type of asset, any dollar amount you can transfer to your spouse and there's no five year look back. So that's why it, let's say husband and wife own everything jointly. She needs to go into a nursing home. Um, we'd want to at least, hopefully we get to this while she's still able to sign legal documents. Mm -hmm. If not, hopefully she has a durable power of attorney in place and maybe she's named her husband as her, attorney, her agent under her POA. We could transfer everything, including her ownership of the house over to him and it's a non-countable asset as for her. There's no five-year look back period because she's giving it to her spouse. So with a revocable trust, if it stayed in the, in the trust, it wouldn't be protected. Mass Health would say they would make you take it out of the trust and basically get it into his name. Um, so yeah, so basically it would have to be an irrevocable trust in order to be protected from nursing homes. Yes. Great question. So the question is, if your house is in an irrevocable trust, can you sell it? The answer is yes. However, there's a catch. Uh, usually we're talking about a scenario where, um, let's say you've got a house that's worth a half million and you own it free and clear. Let's make it easy. And you want to downsize to a condo. You're done shoveling. You're done with mowing the lawn. So you want to downsize to a $300,000 condo. Uh, question is, can you sell it? And, in, and with an irrevocable trust, most likely it would be one of your adult kids who would be trustee. You could call them up and say, hey, I want to sell the house, I want to buy a condo. And they as trustee would sell the house and then go out and, and actually purchase on behalf of the trust, purchase the condo, and you could live in it. The catch is that the $200,000 that's left over after selling the house because you're downsized and you'd like to cash in on some of that equity or all of it, add it to your nest egg, that's gonna fund your retirement. Um, you can take a bunch of cruises with $200,000. Uh, the catch is that that $200,000 that's left over after those transactions, it stays in the trust because that 200,000 was part of the original principle, the original equity of the first home that went into the trust, that would have to stay in the trust. So it would be locked out, so you couldn't spend it. You could swap houses, you could sell that house and buy a different one, or if you just want to move, let's say you don't want to downsize, you just want to move. Um, but if there's any money left over, you wouldn't be able to pull it out. The only money that you would be able to access from that trust is income generated from the trust property. So if, it, if they had a rental unit on the property, you could get the net income from the rents. Uh, you could take that $200,000 and tell your kid, invest that in CDs or something that's going to give me income. So in this case, 200000 you probably get... 4,000 bucks a year in income that could be paid out of the trust to you, but you know, it's almost like a consolation prize. You're not gonna do a lot with 4,000, maybe one cruise, like Bermuda, four days or something, you know? So, um, so yeah, so does that answer your question? All right.